I'll get started with um, just um, some introductions. Welcome everyone. My name is Deb Roundtree. I'm the Associate Academic Dean at Eastern Maine Community College. And I also work for the University of Maine System in the partnership between the two centers, one here in East Millinocket, the Katahdin Higher Ed Center, and the other one in Dover, the Piscataquis, um, excuse me, Penquist Higher Education Center, <laughs> formerly Piscataquis County, but Penquist is, is what the, the name is of the center there. And just wanna welcome everyone here um, this evening. And we, before I go ahead and get started, I just wanted to share the agenda with you so that, um, we had planned to do this as a live event and we um, went with um, a virtual event because of the increase in uh, COVID restrictions happening in the communities that we serve. So I thought it was important to be able to um, have a virtual event. And this is, we see this as the first of a couple different events. This one is more geared towards our partners um, in the community and those that refer students to us and learners to us. And, and uh, it's really in, important to have uh, the connection and for you to understand what this pro process is and what this program involves and what um, we see as an opportunity to connect uh, people in these communities to resources. So I'm just gonna go ahead and get started by showing uh, sharing the agenda. And um, the Zoom link for anyone that um, you might wanna share this with, we will record this, it is being recorded now and we'll be also able to share the recording after. So just thought we could go ahead and get started with some brief introductions with everyone. And I will just um, go ahead with the first person on my screen, which happens to be Mercedes. Hello everyone, um, it's nice to see some familiar faces. Um, so if you don't know me, I'm Mercedes Nelson and I am the business, uh, business development and training coordinator, big mouthful words um, at Eastern Maine Community College. So helping to stand up our workforce training, um, working with uh, employers and um, our non-credit side of the house courses. Thank you, Mercedes. And I'm gonna pass the ball to Sue Mackey Andrews. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sue Mackey Andrews, and I live here in Dover Foxcroft in Piscataquis County. And I'm the facilitator for Helping Hands with Heart, the Maine Highlands Investment Partnership, and the Maine Highlands Working Communities Challenge Grant. Thank you. And I guess we'll go with Kevin next. Hello, everybody. I'm Kevin Gregory. I work for East Maine Development Corporation as a workforce development specialist. Uh, in the East Millinocket office. I cover from Howland North and since uh, virtual, a lot of other places around the state. And I work closely with Deb. Thank you, Kevin. I guess next will be Rachel. Hi, I'm Rachel Kahn. I'm the Director for Workforce Development at Eastern Maine Community College. Um, I've met a couple of you, so it's good to see you again. Excited to meet the rest of you. Um, this is an, an exciting project, so I'm excited to kind of uh, hear Deb's presentation and get your, some of your feedback about what we can do to, to make this a success. Thank you, Rachel. Um, how about you, Christina? Okay, I'm Christina Garno. I am the EMCC employee at their Dover site. And that's pretty much who I am. Thank you, Christina. And how about Barb over in Dover? Hi, I'm Barb Skinner. I'm the newest workforce development specialist at EMDC. Um, I cover the Piscataquis area and um, Dexter, Newport, and actually I'm opening someone in Old Town due to good old virtual. <laughs> Thank you, Barb. How, how about, is it Aaron Benson? Yes, it is. Hi, I'm Erin Benson, and I uh, am new to EMDC, Eastern <clears throat> Maine Development Corporation, as Director of Workforce Services. Thank you, Erin. Um, how about we go to our guest, Christopher Quinn, from Near Pier today? Hi, everybody. I'm Christopher Quinn. I'm from Near Pier, and uh, we're an education technology company based here in Maine. 
and uh, we, we help students be successful by driving learning community and peer engagement. Uh, before near peer, I've been in higher ed for oh, 25 or 30 years. Uh, so I am, I'm very aware of the importance of education and, and the workforce development uh, piece. And we're here to partner uh, with uh, Destination U to, to help achieve those goals. Thank you, Christopher. Great introduction. Um, and how about Carolyn over in Dover as well? Hi, I'm Carolyn Haskell. I'm the director of the Piscataquis Valley Adult Education Cooperative. We're located at um, in Dover um, at PHEC. And I'm excited to meet some of you. I haven't met everyone here. Um, and looking forward to hearing more about this opportunity. Great, thank you, um, Carolyn. How about Jess? Hi, uh, my name is Jessica Johnson. I'm the Delta Ed uh, Director at RSU 67, and I work uh, with Deb. Thank you, Jess. And um, Jasmine, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. I'm Jasmine Polster. I work part time with the Katahdin Collaborative. I'm also an alumni of KHEC with their outdoor education program. And I also am a board member on the RSU 67 school board. So hi, nice to meet you all and good to, I have a baby, so I will be off screen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jasmine. And I think that I've touched everyone, correct? I don't think I've missed anyone. Perfect. So um, I'm going to share on an, an, our PowerPoint to talk a little bit about what is uh, Destination U. It's a very brief PowerPoint, but um, like I said earlier, that um, kind of the gist of this evening is to help our partners to understand what uh, Destination U is and talk about the timeline and talk about the importance of your role all as partners with us and how you can help um us make that this program a um, much more effective opportunity for learners in our communities we just so very brief powerpoint um hopefully you can all see this on your screen but um, we are here today to talk a little bit about Destination U, uh, your plan, your path, and your success. So this idea is um, something that we've been working on for the college from, from the college for many um, months now in our partners with Education Design Lab, partners with Near Peer in this process of creating a short-term opportunity for those people that live in our regions who are some of the most disadvantaged or some folks that have never had a good opportunity to connect with either you know, employment or higher education and really kind of breaking down all the barriers and breaking down all of the challenges that many of these people face to engaging them to become part of the workforce if they're not working and how we can utilize um, you know, the richness that EMCC and resources such as our partners at Eastern Maine Development Corporation, um, as well as the other partners that uh, are here today, how we can help engage people in the community that often go overlooked or often don't have um, the advantage of uh, having what they need to meet workforce challenges or to decide, you know, their pathway to higher education. So we see this as an opportunity to um, create a pipeline for providing some short-term experience that can lead to some stackable micro-credentials or digital badges per se, that can in turn be rolled over into possible college credit and be an exciting opportunity to help those in our regions at no cost to the individual. And um, with our partnerships like EMDC, that may be able to provide some additional resources such as you know, computer access or childcare, transportation, whatever might be needed to help um, to create a successful opportunity for the people that we serve. 
So <clears throat> Destination U is um, an eight week experience during which learners will cultivate new skills build connections with community members and local employers and to develop a network of supporters in the region. Students will participate in this program will be able to complete their next class or badge at EMCC for free. So part of the work that we've been work, uh, doing with Education Design Lab is a pilot program that will involve um, creating a, a network of people um, for any student or learner that comes to the college that they will be able to have a support system in place could be, you know, faculty, it could be someone in their family, it could be someone from EMDC, it could be someone that they've known in their past, an employer, but someone that's going to kind of step up to the plate to offer them support and offer them, um, you know, the, the push that they need to continue and to, to be able to really help them feel successful to gain more confidence. And originally when we talked about the design of this program, we had talked about 12 weeks. And then in our conversations, the past several meetings, we've decided to kind of scale it back because for many people, 12 weeks seems like an insurmountable amount of time, especially if they've never been to college or taken a class before. So we wanted to make sure that we kept people engaged in a meaningful way. And so eight weeks sort of seems like the sweet spot this program will start in October and will end um, the beginning of December and there'll be the week off of Thanksgiving break. Um, so the logistics of this program, the who are the adults in the Katahdin and Dover communities who are unemployed or underemployed or like I said, may have started college and it did not have a good experience. And so we can help them to maybe um, remediate some of that experience or help them you know, provide another opportunity to take a second, a second try. Um, there'll be a cohort of 15 to 20 learners in each region. That's our kind of goal that we'd like to help. The timeline would be October 9th through December 3rd, the week of Thanksgiving off. Um, we anticipate that this will be a mix of modalities such as online and in-person learning with weekly assignments um, offered asynchronously. So as soon as we have more information about the actual weekly timeline of the expectations and what kind of like a syllabus of the program, we will share this with everyone. We didn't feel like we had that fully in place yet to share. We might say, you know, what's the value of this? What's the outcome of this experience? You know, for our learners, um, we want to consider how their past experiences help to identify their skills and focus on professional goals for the for the future to develop a customized realistic professional and or academic pathway to a new career to create a customized support network for professional academic and personal success and also we feel we felt like it was very important to also encompass a financial literacy component to this um, parts of the curriculum will be utilized from opportunity ready badges that have already been created with Eastern Maine Community College and some of the work that's also been done with our partners at EMDC, sort of the model that they've used for youth in the, in the regions that they serve. The value for this for the employers, and then I think this is a really critical piece, is to make sure that we connect them. Oops. Make sure that we connect our learners with prospective employees in the region and throughout the eight week experience. And to host prospective employees at their workplace to show what working there might be like. And also to, a, uh, to attend possible career fair at the end of this experience to conduct um, on the spot interviews to help employers fill vacancies. So some of the challenges that we have in both of these regions is significant um, lack of workforce. There are many people that live in the, in the regions, but there are also many unfilled jobs, especially the summer. I know here in the Katahdin region that the tourism industry is like desperately needing help. All of um, the organizations that work in um, customer service are desperately needed for help, the same as, as healthcare. So how can we utilize this opportunity to really help employers to understand that we're trying to help them and to 
create a viable pathway to helping them find possible employees in the future from you know the graduates of this program to, that we can refer to them. So how is this destination you unique? So part of what we see is uh, that we could provide a holistic approach to learners' needs, honoring their previous experience and building confidence by identifying skills and knowledge that they already have for learners to create their own pathways for professional and academic success that meets their needs. So this program will be individualized for everyone that, that joins. Um, employers who are actively hiring in both regions will become highly involved and learners will create their own support network to help them through the various stages of their journeys. And to also provide a high level of support and resources from our community partners. So um, we've also been working with Near Peer, who is a Maine based company that has a really uh, interesting app that they've created to connect people in a different way than the normal uh, social media that's out there. So Near Peer is an online engagement platform where learners, employers, and instructors can support one another in this work and beyond. And um, after this part of the presentation, Christopher has some uh, information that he would be sharing about Near Peer. Our other partner that's here this evening is Eastern Maine Development Corporation, who I can't say enough about. We've had a decades long relationship with them in many levels in both of our regions in Piscataquis County, as well as the Katahdin region and in Bangor region as well. They provide incredible resources to all of the people that we serve in these, in these regions. So having them on board really will help to take this to another level for those folks that we're trying to reach out to. And, um, you know, questions that we may, may have is what, what do you like about Destination U? Is any of this information confusing? How might we make this experience better? And how can we help you help us by return, uh, recruiting learners and employers for this program? So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And if anybody would like me to email that PowerPoint out to you all, I can do that as well. And I'd like that. I, I would too. Thank you, Deb. I will get that emailed out to, to everyone. Um, so I think it, it doesn't have a lot of information, but again, it's just enough, I think, to help spur some thoughts or feedback from us. And um, I, I'll get that emailed out to everyone um, later today. So um, with that being said, I'd like to um, let Christopher go ahead and, and um, do his part of this presentation this evening and share what he has with me up here. Unmute. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. Um, uh, yeah, my, my goal is to tell you a little bit about near peer and uh, share some of the experience that students have, uh, things that make near peer a little bit different to achieve the goals that we're talking about uh, here and, uh, and really answer any questions that come up uh, because you know, we recognize some of the key barriers to people who are returning to school, haven't been in school, and uh, we know that what we do helps clear some of those hurdles uh, that they, they naturally have. So, uh, uh, you know, the bottom line is that we want to affect uh, enrollment and retention, graduation, uh, the overall student success, uh, um, student wellness, and, 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 you know, coming from a place of, uh, of equity as well. The basic premise of near peer and what we do uh, with our partners there's an example of some of our partners across the country um, uh, you know is this idea that students who are more engaged with each other are more likely to enroll show up and achieve success that that's the premise uh, and we've got uh, you know significant outcomes with with uh, the partners below you know, we're, we're, we're proud as a, a Maine-based company to be affecting students in Maine and, and, and across the country. Um, a little background, one of the key uh, uh, 
uh, education data uh, groups in, 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 uh, in higher ed just last week named us as main company, one of uh, five companies to, to watch in education technology. So we're, you know, we're, we're quite proud of uh, uh, what we can do and, and, and mostly how we can help with, with uh, uh, Destination U. So th these are the needs that we serve in summary. Uh, students, all types of students, traditional age students, non-traditional age students, people who have done something else in life and are shifting entirely. Overall, all students have this number one concern. Uh, will I fit in? Will there be other people like me with shared experiences and uh, uh, you know, where I'm going? And this is big. This is big uh, in this world of the workforce development piece because uh, uh, you know, most of these folks, if they have been on the sidelines, they might be in that 18 to 21 year old group, but chances are they're gonna be in their 30s uh, uh, or 40s. Uh, so the same, the same idea applies. The sense of belonging that you get when you feel like you fit in really leads to persistence outcomes. Just people stay enrolled and graduate and have all the benefits that an education will give them then. Uh, there's lots of you know, scientific research out there around that. Uh, idea. And it's also rooted in just mental health, both for students and, and for all people. This the social isolation that can come with, uh, 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 you know, being out of a job, uh, being laid off, or, you know, not, not getting beyond uh, the doors of the house, particularly in COVID, um, you know, this is, this is key. So social connectedness. Um, when DEI, diversity, uh, uh, equity, and inclusion, you know, pulling everybody in, not just the, the, the homogenous group that might make up uh, most of um, uh, a student body. And then how students feel about their educational experience is largely influenced by the community that they're, they're in with, both their, their peers and also uh, staff and faculty. So I'll share now just some slides. Uh, uh, President Lisa Larson from Eastern Maine Community College, she and I did a um, um, presentation together at the American Association of Community Colleges talking about uh, um, EMCC's work and how we fit in. And, and this is a natural extension of that. And uh, you know, from her slide here around what we're trying to achieve, these, these, uh, this idea of belonging, student growth, and agency all lead to this engaged learner. Uh, um, this is the focus at AMCC, and we fit in here. We fit in uh, in terms of how we drive the sense of belonging. It's another element here is humanizing staff, right? I think uh, with, with, a, with a population that has not had a lot of um, success in an academic environment before, People they've engaged with historically on staff, it's been very daunting. They're usually delivering some bad message, uh, a negative message. So tearing down that, that barrier, making faculty and staff more accessible, more human is part of what we do uh, uh, as well. Um, and next, let me get this off my screen here. Um, uh, you know, peer relationships, both inside and outside the classroom. When we learn together, we learn better. And I think uh, making those connections are key. We'll, we'll hear from some students in, in some short videos in, in, in a moment as well. Okay, so uh, in summary, reduce isolation, build community, focusing on one-to-one -one relationships. Uh, you know, people finding each other, being part of a group is important. But having those one, two, three, four people with whom you really resonate, that helps uh, 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 drive that success. We want to also be sure that we, we reach all students, not just the extroverts. And you know, a lot of things that feel like social media, it's all about the extroverts. Everybody else watches uh, here and in, in Europe, you'll see. Uh, we want to reach people who are you know, naturally introverted or in a new environment, act like an introvert. You know, they're feeling less confident in this new environment. And we want to make sure that they're, they're all engaged. So for those purposes, uh, EMCC has partnered with Nearpeer uh, to, to uh, help lead some of this work. And we'll look at the app in a, in a moment here, but everything 
in our in our platform, either on the computer or on an app, is driven by a student profile. Students create their own profile about themselves, and it's heavily weighted into uh, things that are their life experiences. Uh, um, you know, are they a military veteran? Uh, are they a transfer student? Are they non-traditional age? Um, uh, you know, are they a parent? Those sorts of things. And then also what are their interests? What do people like to do? Because we always we connect with others around interests. So this is this is a, an EMCC student here uh, that, that we're seeing. She, and she writes in her bio, she's a, a mom of four. Uh, uh, she's the uh, spouse of a, a law enforcement officer. Uh, she wants to become a law enforcement officer herself. So uh, she's, she's going to make a transition uh, as well. Um, we see some of her um, uh, interests here, but also uh, things like her career aspiration. When you see other people sharing a career aspiration, very powerful. And this is a free form field that people type in whatever they want here. So uh, with this, we can see that our uh, algorithms match students with other students with whom they share a lot, of, a lot in common. So this, this uh, student here can be matched with uh, another student who um, uh, uh, also has kids, uh, has an interest in listening to music, watching movies, and two other things. So this is unique. In, 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 in the social media world, all that information is hidden away because that's what's sold to advertisers and near peer. This is a, an ad-free platform. It's, it's sponsored by the college or university that, that we work with. Okay, And students can also work in a, in a, a, a group chat. They can also in, interact in a group chat together. Uh, students like to do this. They immediately feel comfortable because everybody else in there, these are also students with kids. That's an example of a group that they might belong to within your peer. Uh, and, and you know they, they they start chatting and talking and then connecting one to one. We still want to drive that one to one connection. Students sort of get this. They they see how near peer is different. Uh, this is some quotes from some students. It's all students. Uh, uh, you know traditional non traditional. We'll actually see a couple of minutes of non traditional students and and their experience in near peer, um, including uh, one from the MCC. Uh, that's coming up next. So let me move to that. Uh, let uh, this student tell you a little bit about her experience from Europe here. Uh, you'll see a second person in the video. We had an intern from uh, Bates who conducted interviews with a lot of the students who are using Europe here around the country. So I'm also a non-traditional student. I'm 30. Um, and I'm a mom uh, and in the human services program. And so I can um, research in near peer people who have similar stories as mine and um, that's kind of cool because like I said I'm not having the classroom experience due to COVID and stuff like that so if I wanted I could um, research my um, my classmates who are interested in the same things as me and then build connections that way and that's kind of cool yeah. So have you have you made any connections that maybe you've met up with this person in person? I know that's maybe not possible because of COVID or like made any friends through the app? I have made some friends, some friends that are in some of my classes. Um, we connected on near peer uh, to go over assignments. Um, so that was really cool. Um, instead of like using Facebook and because sometimes you don't really know um, that all their whole their whole name and their information typing in you know um, some demographics kinds of limits to search a little and I'm like oh yeah there she is and then I and then I you know have some questions or we go over um, our take on the class and stuff so it has it's been um, super resourceful. Awesome. So is your is your main purpose for using the app academic connections or friendship or? professional connections? I think I've used it as a way to connect academically, but I feel like that's kind of like just the start, you know? It's kind of like something to open a conversation up and um, hopefully then, you know, our connection will grow as we 
um, get to know each other. And, you know, um, sometimes it's hard to be like, hey, you know, I have, I'm kind of socially awkward at times and really hard for me to open up to people um, in, in, in that way, but I, I use it. But I can, if I'm, you know, doing it to meet an academic need and then hopefully it kind of blossoms from there. I, um, and, I and it has for me. Oops. I'm also a non-traditional. All right, so um, one, one more student like this one happens to be from Fresno State in California, but also a non-traditional student. Give just a couple more minutes here and I know I've just got a couple minutes uh, left on my my a uh, lot of time so let's hear from this student too just about a minute i have connected with a lot of people and chatted with a lot of people that have the same major um people i have two kids so there's like a group for people that also are going to Fresno state with kids and um you know people that are coming from close community with me so i'm in i don't know probably 10 different groups of people with similar interests that are all in my class so it's nice to know people before I go and be able to see their names and their faces and then I'll, you know, see them on campus soon. And we're going to be taking the same journey and the same classes and we're starting at the same point. So, you know, we can make those connections now and then already have study buddies and, you know, people in our classes. And um, I don't think I'm the only person that feels like it's a big, scary, anxious life change, you know. Um, and I think everybody would feel better knowing that they know somebody. Bye. So I'm going to stop sharing there. I could take a question or two. Um, and I'll also pull up an instance of near peer, and it is a closed community. It's not students from EMCC don't see students from Fresno State, but I'll, I'll bring up uh, an instance here. And then uh, if you have questions now, just please uh, please let me know. Otherwise, I'll switch screens and show you the interface here. So this is the actual interface at uh, at Fresno State. See, everything starts with uh, with a profile. I have a uh, I have a, a a profile in here and saying who I am. I am. Administrators and staff can also be in. I'm here as a near peer person. Uh, you know, some of my info gets put in, interests get put in, uh, but once all that stuff is in, then the students can click on this discover tab and now the algorithms are matching them with, with other people with whom they share a lot in common. So, you know, I see uh, uh, Sushil here and I are, you know, both in a group with students with kids and we're both age 25 plus and we have interest in you know, cycling and motorcycles and we're parents. So I can see his, his profile here and see where he came from, uh, you know, get a little bit uh, about him. So that's the idea and, and uh, on the one-to-one -one connection side. And this is like implicit permission to connect, which is key and hard to find anywhere else. It's not awkward to do. And once connected, you can have one-to-one -one chat with people. But also in groups, here's an example that I alluded to earlier, students with kids. Uh, there's uh, Sushil again, I can see them in here. But once we're in this group, I see all the students uh, who also have kids, right? Uh, I can scroll down and down here, lots of them. Uh, and if I go to the chat here, I can see these students interacting, you know, uh, like this, this student saying, uh, uh, I haven't had my baby yet, I'm moving, I'm also gonna, 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 you know, going to be a mom. Uh, and this other student says, hey, I'm looking for housing too. So now there is very natural conversation. And from within there, those students could connect with one another and continue that conversation. So, you know, think of this as a real catalyst for connection and building community and learning community overall. So I think I'm uh, a little bit over my 15 minutes, actually, I'm going to say I'm one minute over. So I'm going to stop there and take your questions uh, if you have them. And otherwise I hand it back to you, Deb. Thank you, Christopher. Does anyone have any questions about Nearpeer um, or their platform before we um, turn things over to EMBC? We also have some room at the end of this um, presentation to 
ask general questions as well. So, Deb, so this is, I'm sorry, you go ahead. No, I think it's up. I think you're on the floor, Sue. Okay. Um, this is a question for Christopher. I'm, I'm always sensitive about the, the security, the safety of these kind of systems, you know, um, and, I, and I'm wondering, are things monitored behind the scene to yeah. make sure that people aren't being exploited, et cetera? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, great question. And, and, and one we commonly hear, and let me preface it all by saying it's a very, very safe platform. We don't have problems. We have you know tens of thousands of students who are in, and we don't have problems and it's for a number of reasons. Uh, one, it is moderated and we help moderate it. Any user can help moderate it. Anything can be flagged as inappropriate. Uh, our help desk gets that immediately and we triage it. Uh, users on campus can uh, uh, disable student accounts. They can, uh, uh, they can take down anything that uh, showed up uh, in the app very quickly. But frankly, very little of that happens. Uh, and there's a few reasons. One, there's no anonymity. So only people who are invited and are part of uh, this program uh, are permitted to join. So you know, with, when you have anonymous users, that's when trolling and, and, and bad behavior starts. Second thing is there's no place to post videos, photos, memes, things to like or dislike. The only thing you can do in near peer is uh, learn about other people and, and have a conversation. Uh, with them and those conversations are you know what's what's moderated uh, so uh, uh, students feel safe uh, they are safe and uh, you know any issue that arises uh, you know we're right there with with the administration and it's one of the benefits to you know lots of organizations use facebook groups uh, or things like that very very different ad driven they're free but the reality is, is that the institution has very little control. You can't, you can't talk to Facebook and say anything that, that happens very, very difficult. So it's a key uh, differentiator for us. Great question. I hope I answered soon. So I have a question for you, Christopher. Um, I'm assuming that this is a product that's gonna be used with the people who participate in Destination U. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, Deb, I saw your head shaking. Great. So do you have any concern about, I, I noticed that on your PowerPoint, Deb, you said that uh, you were hoping between 15 and 20 participants. Are, do you have any concern? I mean, to me, uh, uh, there must be some kind of data that tells you um, what a, a good number of people involved in something like this to make it work really well. And I, I, I would think that you know, it would be larger than 15. So do you have any concern about maybe the small number that will be using the platform? Yeah, um, first, I don't, I don't have concern there. And I think there'll be two cohorts. Um, uh, you know, let's say that in total, if it's, you know, 20 or 30, whatever the number is, Think of it like being in a classroom, that you're sitting in the classroom with, with people and maybe you have the nerve to talk to the person next to you and get to know a little, little bit about them. But the appropriate time, we can uh, release this group into the broader EMCC community when the timing is right and then they will be in and they'll have you know, built up uh, some self-confidence and, and experience uh, uh, in here. But um, just even in a, in a group as small as a classroom, just a single classroom, and that's how we'll use it with Destination U. Uh, uh, people uh, are asked to get into a study group or work with somebody else, and they don't know how to do that. They don't know who, who else is in this class, but when you can find somebody that is either geographically near you because you've shared your hometown or you, you, know, you have a similar life experience like being a veteran, or you just you know, like the same TV shows, then that those people feel more comfortable connecting in an academic way. So we, we don't have concerns uh, on that front. And we think that this will speed the, the bonding uh, uh, of the group ultimately. I, I think that's, that's a wonderful point, Christopher. Um, I was just gonna point out for Aaron that 
a lot of our programs that we do, I mean, this obviously is, is a pilot, it's the first pilot, but a lot of our programs that we do are in small cohorts. So when we offer like CNA program or something that's more non-traditional than a regular program that's offered for part of a degree, um, we have cohorts anywhere ranging from eight people up to 20. And that number seems to be like a sweet pot, sweet spot for getting good connection and getting good conversation, getting a really good support system in place. Like Kevin can, he, he understands um, exactly what I'm talking about, where people come into the classroom, a lot of them don't know each other. And by the end of that cohort, when they're finished their training, they're a cohesive group of people that are really there for support, supporting each other, helping each other find jobs, helping with babysitting or transportation. It really becomes just a real seamless um, opportunity to provide a lot of support for people. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I think uh, cohorts that are small nat do that naturally without any kind mm -hmm. of, you know, additional uh, something like near pair. So I, I was just kind of curious what the data told you. So thanks. And one, one of the advantages being rural, that most everybody knows everyone in the Katahdin region. And it's probably the same over in Dover. That, you, you know, it's not like it's, you know, they're not friends, but they know who each, each person is. And uh, I know Jasmine and I both went through uh, the program down to KTAC and we had our own study groups. And without those study groups, some of the people wouldn't have passed. Uh, I have no question about that because we'd have the groups and somebody in the group got it and then they could explain it on their level. I think that um, Deb's not on her head that, you know, everybody made the Dean's list, uh, but it was, it was because uh, we were mill workers, you know, that we treated it like our job and put a lot of time into it and uh, not just go to class and then just try to get by, but they all wanted to succeed because that was their job at the time. Uh, so, and I know Jasmine went through the outdoor rec program and uh, they were like a little family, really, I think. I agree with that too, Kevin. Um, a lot of the classes that I did when I did my college was through um, the ITV, boy, that's dating me. Um, but we had small groups in those classrooms. And I know that with our statistics class, there were three of us and what I didn't know, one of the others knew and we really worked together and we all got A's in the class. And statistics is a really hard class to pass is what I'm told. To get an A, my sister was like, whoa, amazing. Um, so I agree, the small, the small classes can be very beneficial. And, and think about even in the, in, the, in the small groups, some of the people, never get that benefit, they fall away before those form or they connect to others. Those are the people that particularly we want to be sure to bring in and make it easy to connect with the group and and and, and feel the power of that that small group. And one one of the hardest things is to ask for help. You know that people aren't going to ask, but if it's there for them, I think they'll reach out more than um, when I was dealing with the mill workers and we had a big staff here from Bangor and up here, but they wanted to talk to people that they know. So they went to the peer support workers before they went to the their counselors, uh, just because of the familiarity with the people. And um, I think it's a, important to build that relationship with the rest of you, what rest of your, like a team is what they are. And I think it's something that can be very beneficial. Any other questions for Christopher? Thank you so much for that uh, information, Chris. And if you want to email that to me, I can also send that presentation out for anybody that might be interested. That'd be great. Okay. So on um, to the next part of our agenda, just keep it in, in mind with our time here. Um, I think it was you, Kevin, from EMDC, or is it Aaron or? Um, someone going to talk about EMDC's um, resources and support that they can provide? Yeah, I, I can, unless you want to, Aaron. 
Uh, no, you go right ahead. I'm just here to, okay. <laughs> I didn't even know somebody was going to be talking from EMDC. So I'll sit and listen. <laughs> okay. Uh, what well, we have a Workforce Investment Opportunity Act, uh, federal dollars for training, reemployment services. Uh, we have different eligibility criteria for adult if you're a uh, low income, uh, English first learner, uh, homeless, basic skills deficient, we can make you eligible as an adult. Uh, we have dislocated worker who is somebody that's been laid off or terminated from their job um, so that we can help them with that. We also have a farm worker. If you've been involved with a farm work in the last two years and half of your work or half of your pay is been from farm work, we can get you eligible for the National Farm Worker Jobs Program. Uh, we have a youth program, ages 21 to 24, and there's a lot of criteria that can make uh, people eligible. Uh, Deb's real familiar with our program, so we get lots and lots of referrals from Deb uh, that we don't have to go out searching. Uh, I think I've got 10 in the last two weeks, uh, just for our nursing program that's coming up. And finally, we, we do have some uh, national emergency grants and we have one with, it's called Connecting with the Opportunities. People have been affected by the opioid pandemic. So it's just five different uh, pots of money that we can draw from. And some of the things that we can help with are unmet uh, need for tuition, books and fees. Uh, we can help with supportive services. Uh, we do have caps of what we can help with. And we go through and try to take any hurdles we can away from the person. So if the person, their track is to become going to school, uh, we'll probably be enrolling them, I would think, and getting them ready. This is their first step towards going to school. Um, and we can help with a lot of, we can help with job search. Uh, we have businesses, outreach teams. We have, I know there's gonna be some new businesses going into the mill. They may be part of this. There could be some job opportunities for young people um, right here in the area. Uh, I know Deb and I both met with Nautilus, the group that's going to do it, and they're looking for skilled people. Some people are going to be some need some specialized trainings. So we've done that. Um, we've done a bunch of CNA classes and things like that. We have a nursing cohort rate in in uh, Staten Region High. I suppose what region is it, Deb? But Staten Higher Education Center, um, and you, we usually get 25 or 30 applicants for five positions. You know, it's just so much easier for people not have to travel to Bangor and they can get these services. So if there's any questions, I'll try to answer them. Can I just add some stuff that's going to be happening in the Dover area? Yeah. Sure. Um, Kim and I are going to be going out and talking with some different um, companies about, um, we already have an appointment with a, a local um, grocery store. Um, about job training opportunities. Um, the owner slash manager of the store is really anxious and, and wanting to help um, to have some job job training and whatnot in the in the store. I know him personally, we've talked some, but Kim and I will be going in and doing that. Um, I've been talking with um, Carolyn and Eve Sally at the higher ed. They're looking at a program um, that looks like it would be really good to get um, young, young folks back into the workforce. Um, so we're looking at some, some interesting things and Kim and I are gonna be talking with Carolyn and Eve about that as well, um, just to coordinate things and see how much more we can do. There hasn't been somebody in in the building from EMDC for a while and it's been sporadic. So I'm really excited about working with everyone over there and I'm hearing some awesome ideas. So yeah, we're we're gonna build her up over there. Thank you, Barb. I was just, I was talking a little bit about that before you joined the call about the critical nature of anyone that um, is referred to this program about directly referral to you and Dover or Kevin and East Philanarchit to make sure that um, those supportive services are in place when this program starts. And I think 
you know, looking at who walks in the door here and in Dover, a very similar population, about 99% of the people that walk in qualify for one of those programs. So it's a win-win. And, you know, when Kevin knows, I, I will run him right into the ground, right, Kevin? <laughs> the highest caseload in the state. I so, couldn't think of the name of the, the program, but now it's in my head. It's it's um a retail program to get folk to, to get kids educated in retail and get a certificate because there's a lot of retail in the in the Piscataquis area and it's a fast growing, it's fast growing retail is. Um so it would be to get the Carolyn's idea is, and I agree with her, is to get the youth involved in that program while they're in in the ends of high school. Um, and it will help them hopefully want to continue their education from there. Right. And that, so, that customer service component in that is really critical too. Yeah. So yeah, Carol and I have been talking about that and, and Kim, we have a day plan that we're going to be doing some different things coming up and we're planning that in that, in that time slot as well. Perfect. Wonderful. Does, does anyone have else have any other questions about the program or the process or anything else? Um, and then I wanted to just leave a, a couple of minutes for my colleague, Rachel, to see if she has anything to add or Mercedes about the program after we take any other questions. Yeah, but I'm, this is Sue and I'm, I'm wondering about outreach and recruitment. How, what are you guys thinking about how you're gonna tackle that? So that's a great question. That's why we have all of you valuable people or in partners here to really help to identify people that you may be working with or somebody that's come through your door recently that is like on the fence or having issues about finding a job or you know thinking about they may want to go to school but they may not be a good candidate. How we can engage some of those folks that we've already known or that have been referred to your organization as well that may benefit from this program. And also, you know, there may be employers out there that have someone working for them that may be just, you know, working part time and the employer's kind of uncertain whether they're going to work out. They may need some additional skills to help them. And, and this program could, could help with those people as well. So, we're still working through that process, and I certainly will would ask Rachel or Mercedes, you know, my colleagues, to if they have anything else to add to that. I mean, it's a work in progress, so we're open to feedback. We're open to ideas about recruitment. I think you know the chambers are going to be important. Um, the schools are going to be important. The guidance counselors. Um, and that will allow us more time to connect with people from the schools by not starting this until October. I think they're going to be important. Our partners, like with Penquis, um, as well as other groups that here in the Katahdin region, it's Katahdin Collaborative. We have a, a large variety of people from businesses and organizations that are part of that group. And in Piscataquis County, we have Sue's Helping Hands and Heart, who has a really large uh, group of people that have been doing a lot of work over in Piscataquis County. We have people like Georgia that's working with uh, people in recovery that, you know, she may have some ideas of people that would, would fit this program. And in the Katahdin region, we also work very closely with a woman's recovery house that has a lot of turnover and a lot of new people coming into that program, which I think could be ideal for this as well, because they've gone through a lot of changes and, and um, they're trying to get back back on their on their um, you know stable life and trying to either find a job or go to school so they may be ideal candidates for them as well great question Thanks, so. i would add to that and just sort of um you know and i know deb sort of mentioned this earlier but we are very much in the beginning phases of the actual planning of all this and we're looking forward to being able to share an actual calendar with you all that outlines sort of what those eight weeks look like and the different assignments and the different experiences these folks are going to have and hoping that that will sort of give a little bit more of a solid understanding of what the outcomes are going to be for folks and that that might help inform who you think might be a good fit for this. Um, this is a, sort of a high level showing of what this is and sort of just sort of planting a seed and letting you know the direction we're going but we're looking in the next couple of weeks we'll get you guys some documents that have some really solid outlines about what that eight weeks is going to look like. 
And those outlines will also contain information about the actual micro credentials as well and what's covered for, what's covered with that because I think that that will be a question as far as like the general public when we get ready to have those informational sessions you know that's going to be fairly new information for them and like what is a credential what is I mean what's a micro credential what's a digital badge what does it mean what does it stand for what's the use of it I think those sorts of things would be really good to clearly articulate with anybody that's interested in this in this program. I think it would be great also to uh, explain the value of that to employers. So if they saw it on a resume, it would mean something to them. Right. We have a lot of work. I think Maine is just so far behind behind in this. And Maine has a, a lot of work to do to get people to understand the value of that and how they can be stacked and built upon and what it can lead to. And, and so, you know. Yeah, and so this is the pilot, right? So what, what we have coming in this year is our pilot. We're hoping that we can use this to sort of inform steps going forward to really curtail this to certain employers and in certain industries and add components to it that will be healthcare specific or hospitality specific or customer service specific and get those specific employers involved. Um, so hopefully, hopefully this will inform that going forward and we can create a sustainable model to do this in a way that really supports employers directly in the skills and, and things that they're looking for directly. Yeah, one other thing I think I'd like to just point out real quickly is, you know, in Piscataquis County, Sue heads up the Working Communities Challenge Grant. Uh, Jasmine, who's on the call, she's also the consultant to work with the Katahdin Collaborative that's also involved in that Working Communities Challenge Grant. And a lot of the work that those two groups are doing and a lot of the people that they've engaged are, um, I think, really key components to reaching out to work with young people in the region and work with young adults that aren't working and how we can um, you know, already utilize uh, opportunities in the two communities and to help move this forward. Because I think there's so many similarities between all of this work. Jess or Jasmine, I know that you have your cameras off, but do you have any questions? I think I, oh, I got sunlight right behind me. It's hard to see. Um, no, I don't think I have any questions so far. Are you going to share the uh, PowerPoint with us? Yes. Okay. Okay. And I was wanting to put a little blurb for my fall flyer you had sure. something like that i sent a flyer and i'm not sure if you got it but i will also when i send your email i'll attach that flyer to everyone as, as well depending on which region okay. you're in the flyer uh the newest version of the flyer i sent out last week but i'll send it out again okay. and i see jasmine noted that she didn't have any questions at this time Any other questions, concerns, comments? Rachel and Mercedes, do you have anything that you want to add? I don't know that I have anything I want to add. I just want to thank folks for joining us. And I um, please engage. Like, if you think of anything or you read something and something spark, you know, reach out to Deb. We're open and flexible, and we're still in the beginning phases of creating this, and we want it to be successful. So your input's really, really valuable. Um, so please, anything that you think would be helpful, throw it our way, please. Thank you. So sort of the yeah. next step, what, go ahead, Kevin. I, I was wondering, I know you recorded this, where will it be posted so we can refer people to it if they have questions? So I am going to send the link to Mar uh, Mariah, who's on campus. She's the marketing coordinator and she will have the link posted so that we could share it with anyone. And she's also going to keep the link up on the EMCC website for people that want to sign up for information about it. So I'll share that when I have the link available. Um, the only other thing I can think of is moving forward, we plan to have another informational session. I think I mentioned this earlier to uh, potential participants or people that you you know may have referred or any interest. And that um, presentation will be geared more towards um, 
that population and we will let you know when that date is when we have it identified we're thinking like late august very early september so that we'd be ready to start um, in october so deb this is sue and um most of these conversations that i find myself having are grocery store conversations with people i had two yesterday and i really would like to have something really quick to hand to people with contact information, but sort of a what's in it for me thing. Mm -hmm. You know, why would I want to do this? Um, and I think I've shared before, we're hearing more and more stories about people who are looking for a job change mm -hmm. for whom the pandemic has been an educational opportunity that has taught them that they're capable of more than what they were doing either now or before the pandemic. So I something that, you know, you know, that whole whiff and what's in it for me kind of thing. Mm -hmm. What what are you going to get from this? And and how are how 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 is the system committed to making sure you're successful? Right? That's that's great. And that's uh it's good to hear that. I think you know in our next meeting we our group meets every week. Um, we can talk about that and come up with a template or a, um, information that you can share. Um, bye, Christopher. Thank you. Um, you know, we can share with you all, but I think that that's great to hear that because we, we even have a one pager, but that might even be too much. Yeah, the, we're finding literacy issues. And so we've gone to small for much of our advertising during COVID. We've gone to if. Um, um little two and three line sentences mm -hmm. rather than you, the long articles because we were finding that advertorials they're called we were finding that the longer detailed articles it, they were too dense for people and they weren't interested in anything past maybe a paragraph or so that was going to catch them and bring them in for more information that's a great point and that we will take it very wisely at our next conversation because you're right I mean if, if it's if it's hard for us to understand it's going to be more difficult for others to understand so it's a great conversation to have that that pointed out short and sweet people don't want to spend a lot of time right and for the participants I hate to say this but I come from um, working with mental health for the last six, 18 years. So I know many times I've had to look at positions and say, okay, now can you dumb it down so I can understand? And I use that term so that my client wouldn't feel stupid when I ask that question that right. way. Yeah. But I know Piscataquis County has, like, like Sue just said, a lot of illiterate folks. Um, that's something I'd like to talk with people about too, is we don't have literacy volunteers in Dover anymore. We don't have um, a lot of those components that are needed for them to just get their high school diploma, never mind the college piece that we're talking about right now. And that's really important. So I think that the, the brochure for the participants needs to be and I hate to use that term, it needs to be dumbed down so that people really understand what's going on because they don't want to ask. They don't want to ask, what does this mean? Right. Um, so I do believe that's very important. Thank you so much for pointing that out, Barb. We really want to be cognizant of, of all people and that's a great point. Yeah, and I know folks that want to go back to school but they feel they're too stupid to do it. And I don't know how many times I have to say, you know what, you're very smart in so many ways and there's different creative ways to learn. So I think it's important that we reach those folks as well. For sure. There's also something that's very unique and different about a non-traditional learner, someone who's older, who has gone back for, um, you know, um, an educational endeavor. Um, but when I say what's in it for me, it's really going to be sort of that bulleted 
simple, what do I get? What's expected of me? Um, who do I talk to more? Um, and I'm finding that one of the comments that I'm hearing back from people is, I know I'm capable of more, but I don't know what I'm interested in. So there's not a lot of information that people have at their fingertips to tap job, career opportunities, which may or may not already exist in the region. You know, thinking about the entrepreneurs, which is a really ripe opportunity here. So thanks. So maybe something mm -hmm. even in like in a format of a postcard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. That I could hand to people, right? And whip that right out of your purse. And out of my purse, right. Great. Thank you. I got you. So I might just add just real quick, like one of those things that we can uh, right now identify that learners would be receiving by going through this pilot is they will get three college credits for going through our Opportunity Ready course. Um, and I didn't want to use the term micro credentials, but those are included in those three credits. So the um, opportunity already is the same as our first year experience. So we accept that as a credit uh, credit course and UMA also is accepting that as a uh, three credit course. So it's just kind of one of those quick little, you know, bullet points is, you know, this is what you're getting out of it. This is the credential that um, you will walk away with um, just as one of those pieces. But I mean, there's a, there's layers to that right so i think you know we will start to outline those better but definitely i just wanted to kind of uh put that out there as one of the things we can identify right now as definitely being one of those um selling points i guess so we are at 607 and i'll just ask one more time if anybody has any questions or comments before we can um leave the conversation a bit earlier and um, start planning and making amendments to what we talked about tonight and getting back with you. I will send the PowerPoints out tomorrow morning and um, the recording, as soon as we get the link for the recording, uh, we should be good to go with that as well.